For hundreds of years, painters, then photographers, and finally filmmakers have sought ways to allow their illusions to break through the plane of the canvas or screen and make the experience more three-dimensional, more surrounding, more real. Virtual reality is a computer medium designed to give you the impression of being inside of an artificial world. It allows designers to construct worlds that people can visit and interact with as they please. Unfortunately, these two-dimensional images of virtual worlds are like those of a TV travelogue to some exotic land. Interesting, but it's just not the same thing as being there. With this in mind, Intel recently developed a virtual reality presentation in cooperation with the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. You know, it was a bit of an experiment, I mean, bringing virtual reality technology to the public in an art museum in New York City. We thought we had a good idea, but we weren't really sure how well it would be received. And we were like overwhelmed. We sold out every day. Over 250 editors came to see the show from magazines around the world. A dozen TV crews from around the world, Brazil, Europe, Australia, Japan, came, covered the exhibit. It was really a, a gratifying experience to see the public's response and their hunger for this exciting new way of using personal computers. While the exhibit demonstrated that virtual reality's value goes well beyond the arts, the advent of VR is especially significant in the context of art history. Remember, that one of the great thresholds crossed during the Renaissance was the development of linear perspective. This technique allowed artists to create paintings with a much greater sense of reality than ever before. It was one of the most stunning achievements of its time, impacting architecture, philosophy, war, and forever changing our perception of the world. Virtual reality is the crossing of the next threshold. With it, we are now able to step through the two-dimensional plane and into three-dimensional interactive worlds of our own invention. Most people are rather surprised to learn that this threshold was actually first crossed in the late 60s by Ivan Sutherland. Remember that this was a time when punch cards were considered the state of the art for most of us. While these efforts certainly illustrated new potential uses for computers, it took till the early 80s for the next step to occur. That's when NASA computer engineers were the first to begin putting the new technology into practical application. The software side includes the user application that describes the nature of a given world. Then there's the simulation manager and the 3D model database. On the other side are hardware components that include a graphics processor, a sound processor, and a device to accept input from external sensing devices such as helmet position sensors and joysticks. As you can see, VR integrates a number of functions that would be considered to be fairly sophisticated applications onto themselves. This illustrates the flow of information between the reality engine and its user. Obviously, there are many possibilities for input and output devices. Full immersion requires a special helmet not just because of how it can serve peripheral vision, but also for its ability to track head movement and supply three-dimensional sound. Various joysticks, wands, and gloves can be used to move around and manipulate objects in virtual space. As you might imagine, virtual reality requires fairly powerful computers. The advent of 486 and now Pentium processors has brought about a real blossoming of VR activity on personal computers. This presentation is really an opportunity to show how personal computers have crossed a, a threshold. They're now possible to do a whole new category of applications, graphical applications, whereby information goes from being zeros and ones and numbers on a page to a kind of new visual language. It's really an exciting breakthrough. For artists, it means involving the public in new kinds of experiences. Entertainers as well can now create dynamic, almost movies that you step into. For education, it's amazing. Children, adults, will be able to visit ancient Egypt or a Viking village and participate in a historical simulation. Or they might be studying chemistry and being able to be down there and with the atoms as they molecularly evolve. 
This show focused on PC platform works by designers as divergent as musician Thomas Dolby, software designer Paul Marshall, artist Jenny Holzer, and educator Lynn Holden of Carnegie Mellon University. This one? This was the first thing that I did. It's a torus in which uh, you encounter a number of people, or cube heads as the case may be, and these cubes will either flee from you or will uh, let you catch them. And if you do manage to get one, uh, they will talk to you. It's just like real life. You can't tell what someone will say by what they look like. I was attracted to this new medium because I've been all along interested in doing works for a general public and this fits in very nicely uh, because this hopefully will be accessible to almost anyone. The more recent piece that I did was prompted by the events in Bosnia, the slayings and in particular the rape murders and that's the hard content. I made a desolate landscape in which there are a number of abandoned houses and when you enter these houses right on the way to the you will often hear a voice that will testify about what has occurred. The medium is in its infancy and um, I certainly am new to it, but it's clear that it is moving forward at the speed of light and I would like people not only to be hit, but to be hit with good stuff. My real interest in virtual reality came from conversations that I had with the Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Larry Burgess at Carnegie Mellon University, who was interested in the idea of using existing technologies in order to impact the dynamic interactions between students and teachers in uh, an educational environment, such as a university, um, but also things that would allow uh, educators and students to take some of those experiences outside of the college campus. And we were really interested in pushing the edges to see if we could make available a rich amount of interdisciplinary information brought together around some of the critical people and events of the past times. I already had a background in archaeology and uh, Egyptology, so I had the visual materials, I had access to the um, academic content and was interested in using the computer to bring these into my own teaching experiences in the classroom, which ultimately led to the idea of offering a variety of experiences simultaneously to the student. And then we started trying to put these into the computer, anticipating the day when uh, learning environments will really become three-dimensional. So you'll be in a total surround immersive environment and you'll have access to places remote in time and space, and when you get there, you'll be able to interact with agents, guides, intelligent objects, and so forth, to recontextualize the knowledge. So if you're interested in a moment in ancient Egyptian history, you can go to the place, see it the way it looks now as ruins, restore it the way it looked originally, and bring objects that are displaced in many museums all around the world now, but which originally were located in one place around one event and time back into their original context, you will be there with them and you will have experts or people that can illuminate or answer questions for you from a modern perspective and the ancient perspective. And obviously virtual reality is, uh, is the best way to do that. The metaphor mixer was meant to assist any kind of portfolio manager in the assessment of, of the information in the market that uh, nowadays is becoming very expansive. There's a, a huge amount of information available that uh, somebody who is investing in the market needs to be on top of if he's going to make a, a good investment decision. And um, what you see when you bring up the metaphor mixer is uh, you are essentially hovering above it. And it's been grouped out by industry groups and countries so that the intersection of a certain industry group and the country would be a, a square in this grid. And inside each quadrant is uh, a number of different chips, uh, each with a different shape, symbolizing a financial variable, in this case the market capitalization of the issue. Uh, these chips are hovering above the plane and, and below the plane. And the height that they're above or below is also color-coded so that a chip that's rising far above the plane and that's glowing blue uh, could be the percent change in price from yesterday. 
So a stock that's dropped significantly would be way below the plane, uh, glowing red. So as you fly through this world, you're seeing uh, a much higher bandwidth of information than you normally would uh, if you were looking at, say, a, a matrix of numbers. And so what you're seeing is the, the, the patterns across industry groups, across various countries. Uh, you're able to see and isolate the anomalies and, and focus on the opportunity. Okay, what we've done now is we, we've just brought up our software agent. It has been programmed to isolate uh, certain characteristics out of a financial analytic system. And it will put down a tunnel of squares homing in on the particular issue that it has isolated as a particularly attractive uh, trading opportunity. Uh, the reason why the Metaphor Mixer was included in the Guggenheim was that it represents a different way of, of utilizing virtual reality technology. Instead of modeling real world objects and dynamics, it models uh, abstract ideas and concepts. Uh, the prices of the stock, the actual changing stock market prices are just something that's completely abstract. This uh, technique uh, makes uh, uh, mining and, and navigating through complex data and understanding it easy. Well, the virtual string quartet is a, a virtual reality representation of Mozart's 21st string quartet in D major. Uh, the four musicians are computer generated and by putting on a head-mounted display, as we call it, uh, you will perceive yourself to be in the middle of these four musicians, two violins, a viola and a cello. In order to achieve this, when we recorded the Turtle Island String Quartet, we actually used a, a motion tracker to record their, their arm movements. Uh, and the computer-generated figures that you see in the virtual string quartet uh, will be replicating the movements that they, they made. And as I move around in this space, uh, the sound that I hear will correspond. So if you're playing the viola and I put my head next to you, what I'm going to hear is the viola. If I move back over here, I'm going to hear the cello. Or if I cross the room and look back on the four musicians, I'm going to hear the whole ensemble. Well, I feel that, that the uh, arcade game players and home computer fanatics, they're going to get VR anyway, but your grandmother isn't going to get it uh, unless we show her something that would appeal to her. And slaying pterodactyls is not going to appeal to your grandmother. However, a Mozart string quartet might. Um, so it's very enticing to me to be able to put a program like this at the disposal of the kind of people that go to the Guggenheim. Uh, they're a different cross-section. So the challenge to me was to provide content for them which would appeal to them. Intel is going to continue exploring new uses, new ways for the technology to grow. Equally, we'll be looking for creative ways like the exhibit with the Guggenheim to go out and communicate to the world the power of the personal computer.